morning, everyone. <clears throat> We're so glad that you made it here safely this morning. Uh, you know, Jesus said wherever two or three or four are gathered together, he's there with us, and it's a good thing. So, because two or three or four uh, are all that braved it, and but we're glad that you're here this morning and that you made it safely to us. Um, our prayers go out to all those that are out on the roads this morning. Um, we kind of became aware of the icing conditions uh, late to do anything about uh, rearranging our service schedule this morning, and trust that you all made it here safely, and praying that everyone makes it safely home. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to talk about graying gracefully this morning. 1 Corinthians 8, while you find your way there, a um, couple of things for you. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you that we are in a season of fasting and prayer together as a congregation. Uh, we started on Saturday, the 10th of January, and we're going through for 21 days to January 30th. That's a Friday. And uh, we want to ask you to just prayerfully consider setting aside some time to pray and perhaps make some expression of fasting with us. Jesus said that fasting is one of the key to the Christian life. He said, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Uh, there are many different durations of fasting. There are different expressions of fasting. Uh, Pastor Nick has written a little paper to help you know a little bit more about fasting, the spiritual aspect of it, the practical aspect of it, and that's available out on the Welcome Center. If you'd like to read a little bit more about fasting, why we fast, and how to do it, but maybe this week you'd like to set aside uh, a little time for fasting. Maybe you'd like to set aside a couple of days uh, or do a couple of meals a day, uh, whatever expression that you want to make, and pray with us. There's some prayer points in your bulletin uh, for each day of this coming week to pray together. Um, I'm especially praying for prodigals right now, that 2015 is going to be the year that prodigals uh, come back home to father's house. Prodigal husbands, prodigal wives, uh, prodigal kids, prodigal grandkids and family members and uh, so we hope you'll be praying with us and that is all leading up to Friday January 30th that is going to be our first fire in the night of the new year we're going to start at 6 p.m. on Friday the 30th and we're going to go all through the night till 6 a.m. Saturday morning we're going to have different worship teams here all throughout the evening and people leading in prayer and you can come whenever you can get here and stay as long as you'd like to stay and pray with us in the new year uh, and then uh, just want to thank you once again for all of your prayers and all of your giving for our construction. Uh, we're moving along. Uh, actually, the excavator uh, is ready to take away the front entrance. Um, we're just waiting to uh, get an inspection from the fire marshal on the new emergency exits that we created. And so we're kind of the holdup right now. But we do expect um, within the next week or two to lose the front entrance. And then you'll be coming in and out of our services through these doors or the door downstairs. And so thank you for your patience as we just keep going through uh, changes to accommodate the construction. Thank you for your prayers and, and thank you for all your gifts to phase two. All right, look with me if you would in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and let's talk about graying gracefully. Graying gracefully. 1 Corinthians 8, let's start in verse 1. Paul says, now about food sacrificed to idols. When he uses those words now about, he is answering uh, a letter that the Corinthians sent to him posing a number of questions. And so uh, through these chapters you read now about, now about. He's answering questions that they had put to him. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came, and for whom all things live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom all things, through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat it and no better if we do. 
Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in a pagan temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ himself. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Now, Paul's answer to this issue stretches all the way from chapter 8 through chapter 9, all the way through the end of chapter 10. And I want to just, if you'd flip over a page in your Bible, I want to read the very end of chapter 10 and read the conclusion of his answer to this issue. So picking up in chapter 10, flip over a page, chapter 10, and picking up in verse 23, let's read the end of it. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is edifying. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in a sacrifice, then do not eat it, for both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours, for why is my freedom being judged by someone else's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something that I thank God for? So whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they might be saved. All right, let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come to speak to us out of this passage of Scripture this morning. Father, I thank you so much for your people. I thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your promise, Lord, that when we gather in your name, you're here with us. Father, I just pray your peace on every one of our family, Lord, uh, who has been out on the roads, who may be out on the roads now. Father, I pray for your help. I pray for your protection. I pray for your watch care, Lord. I pray that you'd bring everyone safely to and from your house today, Lord. Pray for peace on those that uh, have had incidents along the roads this morning. And Father, I pray now that you'd help us to just focus to receive your word. I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word today. If your heart agrees, just say amen, amen. and amen with me. Well, I ran into a dilemma this week that was a bit of a first for me. I was filling out paperwork for a visa to enter the country of Myanmar and it asked for my hair color and I wasn't sure exactly what to write. I want to ask for your prayers and I want to ask for your partnership coming up in just a little over a week. Our friend Pastor Raymond Mui has invited me to accompany him to the country of Myanmar. You might know it as the country of Burma. We're going to be doing a pastor's conference there for pastors from all over the country. And then Pastor Raymond is going to be doing a three-night open air healing meeting. It is absolutely a miracle that he has gotten a visa to do an open air meeting in Myanmar and they're expecting more than 25,000 people to be at the meetings every night. Just after I left Indonesia last summer, Pastor Raymond had an outdoor crusade. This is a photo from one of the services. At the end of the meeting, they ask uh, they give people an invitation to receive Christ and if Muslim men have received Jesus, they ask them to take their prayer cap and to throw it down on the ground and to leave it behind. And so after everyone leaves, the crusade staff goes through the grounds and they collect all the caps and that's how they count how many conversions, how many decisions there were for Christ and it is in the tens of thousands every evening. So we want to ask for your prayers while we're traveling and we want to ask if you would help Harvest Time to sow a very good seed into this crusade. Uh, 
The budget is $85,000 for the pastor's conference and for the open air meeting. Um, you can see the, that's all the sound and tech equipment. You can't see the stage in that picture. But Pastor Raymond told me that the church in Myanmar, which is very oppressed, which is very poor, has raised $35,000 of the budget. And Pastor Raymond is raising the rest. And I'd like to take a very good seed with me from harvest time to sow into this crusade. So next weekend, we're going to ask you if you'd give in an extra offering so that we can all share in the harvest that is about to come. Um, there's a very special place in my heart for Burma, and I'm going to talk about that next week. But uh, now let's get back to my dilemma, hair color. In the past, I, I have always been easily able to write the color black, but now my kids are reminding me every day that my hair is no longer black, that it's going gray. So I thought maybe I'd write salt and pepper on the form. But then it occurred to me that the Burmese consulate probably would not know what to do with salt and pepper, so I wrote black slash gray. And with that, I crossed the threshold into a new season of life called graying gracefully. I am not going to fight it. I'm not going to try and <clears throat> hide it like some people. I'm just going to let gray be what it is, and I'm going to try and gray gracefully. And maybe that helps us to understand the heart of what Paul is trying to say to us in these chapters. Let gray be gray, and learn how to gray gracefully. For the last few months, we've been reading this letter to the very, very messy church in the Greek city of Corinth. And we've discovered that this is not an ordinary letter, it's a letter from heaven. It's a letter that speaks across time and distance to you and to me. You know, so far, everything that we have read in this letter could have easily been written in 2015 as it was in 55 AD. But in chapter 8, we run into an issue that is still an issue for believers in some parts of the world, but for us, it is not an issue at all. It's the problem of meat on sale in the marketplace that had been offered to a pagan god first. The city of Corinth was saturated with pagan temples in which there were daily animal sacrifices. This is a picture of the temple of Apollo in Corinth that was standing when Paul ministered in that city. And part of the meat was burned on the altar. Part of the meat was given back to the one who offered it to take home to eat with his family. And part of the meat was given to the priest. Only the priests couldn't possibly eat that much meat, so they'd keep whatever they wanted, and the rest they would sell wholesale to the vendors in the meat market. It was pretty much impossible to buy meat in Corinth that was not from a sacrifice. And it would be pretty much impossible to be a guest anywhere and not be served meat that was from a sacrifice. Weddings, parties, business dinners, birthday bashes, you name it. And there was sure to be meat there that was from a sacrifice. And the venues for parties was the fellowship halls of the pagan temples that were rented out to people who wanted to hold a party somewhere. Now, other than the Buddha statues that we pass on our way into Chinese restaurants, this particular issue is a non-issue for us. Nevertheless, I want to tell you that these chapters are some of the most helpful chapters in the New Testament because they help us to know what to do with a very sticky problem, the problem of gray areas. What do we do when we have a question over an issue that the Bible does not address specifically? How do we make the right decision about what we can do or what we shouldn't do as followers of Jesus? How do we make the right decisions when our fellow believers don't ever seem to agree on what is the right decision? And not only do they not agree, but you may have discovered that they disagree very disagreeably. What do we do about all the gray areas? Is it okay to let our kids trick or treat? Is it okay to give out candy at our door? Is it okay to go to a costume party? Is it okay to listen to secular music? Is it okay to listen to some kinds of secular music but not other kinds? Is it okay to attend concerts? Is it okay to go to a club? Is it okay to dance? Is it okay to dance some dances and not other dances? 
Is it okay to smoke? Is it okay to chew? Is it okay to drink alcohol? Is it okay to serve alcohol to someone? Is it okay to get ink? Might be okay for you. It's not okay if your last name is Harvison. Is it okay to play the lottery? Or to enter the office football pool? Or to go to the casino? Is it okay to see an R-rated movie? Or a horror movie? Or a violent movie? Or any movie at all? Is it okay to play this video game or that video game? Is it uh, okay to wear this or that? Is it okay to post that selfie on social media? If you have a question mark, I'll tell you what, don't do it. Is it okay to do yoga? Is it okay to do karate or taekwondo? Is it okay to belong to a lodge? A and the list of the gray areas goes on and on and on. As we journey through this life following Jesus, there are many shades of gray that we have to contend with. And quite honestly, the church has not always done gray very gracefully. The pendulum always seems to be swinging from one extreme to the other. At one moment, we're treating gray areas like absolutes. That's the way it was when I was a kid. But at the next moment, we're treating absolutes as if they were gray areas. That's the way it is today. And neither of those approaches ever work. The church always messes up badly when it treats gray areas like absolutes or when it treats absolutes like gray areas. So how do we gray gracefully? How do we navigate the gray areas without making them into absolutes nor violating the absolutes? Looking at Paul's words, I see four principles for graying gracefully, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Four principles for graying gracefully. The first is the principle of love. The principle of love. You know, when it comes to navigating gray areas, Paul doesn't begin at all where I would expect. Rather than focusing on our own spiritual health, Paul begins by focusing on the impact of our choices on others. Have you ever struggled to be patient with someone who has no idea what he's talking about? Especially if the issue that he's bloviating about happens to be your field of expertise. Some of the Corinthian believers were having a hard time being patient with their brothers who didn't know what they were talking about. Before coming to faith in Christ, some of the Corinthians had been idol worshippers. They were the ones who brought the sacrifices to the pagan temples. They participated in the dinners in the temples and the drunken revelry that followed. They took home a portion of the meat that was given back to the offerers. And even though it belonged, they belonged to Christ now, it was very hard for them to shake the memories of their idolatrous past. They believed that the spirits of the pagan gods were absorbed into the meat that was sacrificed in the temple, and they believed that if they ate the meat, they could be possessed by those spirits even though they belonged to Christ. They believed that Christians should not eat the meat, and it offended them if any Christian did. The rest of the believers were frustrated. Why don't those others know that the pagan gods are nothing? Why don't they know there's nothing wrong with the meat? It's okay to eat the meat. They should know that. In fact, some of the believers went so far as to suggest that it was important to eat the meat just to prove that we have the freedom in Christ to do so. Paul said, it's true. We do know that the idols are nothing. Although people worship all kinds of gods, they worship planets and they worship stars, they worship gods in the shape of animals and creepy crawling things, although they do that, we know that there is only one God, the Father. We know that all things came from Him and exist for Him. We know that there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. We know that there is only one Savior who gave Himself for us. Every other God demands a sacrifice. We know that Jesus is the only one who sacrificed Himself for us. We know that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, all the meat belongs to him, no matter what lifeless statue it was laid in front of. We know that eating anything doesn't bring us closer to the Lord or separate us from him. We know all these things, but not every believer does. Paul says some of the believers have a weaker conscience. 
You know what Paul means by that is precisely the opposite of how it sounds to us. By weaker conscience, Paul means that they had an overactive conscience. It's not that they were under conscientious, they were over conscientious. Because of the experiences of their past, some of the believers had sensitivities to things that for the rest of us are nothing. Some believers struggle with guilt that doesn't come from the Lord and they easily feel like they've sinned. Some believers struggle with fear that they're going to fall back into their former way of living. Some believers have a hard time shaking the religious teaching that was ingrained into them as kids or as young people. And there are just some things that no matter how they try, they will never feel right to them. I know some of you like that. It, no matter how hard you try, it never looks right when someone wears shorts in the sanctuary or when you see a young kid with a ball cap in the sanctuary. Some believers are just followers by nature. And they take their clues from other believers. They, they don't pause to consider whether they're opening a door that they'll regret later. In these cases, Paul says what we know has to take a back seat to loving those who don't know what we know. One of the beautiful messages in this chapter is the value of everyone in the body. Even the weak ones deserve to be treated with regard and dignity and respect in the body. Jesus said, I tell you, the least in the kingdom is greater than the greatest of those born of men. In chapter 8, Paul gives us the first principle for graying gracefully. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Your freedom might draw a weak brother into sin, so this weak brother for whom Christ died may be destroyed by your knowledge. And if you wound your weak brother in this way, you sin against Christ himself. When it comes to navigating our gray areas, what if rather than thinking about ourselves, we started by thinking about those who are watching us? What if we thought first about the kids who are looking up to us? What if we thought first about the new believers in Christ who are escaping sin-broken lives and are looking up to us for guidance? What if we thought first about the brothers and sisters in Christ who have sensitivities in certain areas because of the experiences of their past? In our decisions, what sensitivity should we show to our brothers and sisters who are recovering from alcohol addiction or drug addiction? What sensitivity should we show to those recovering from sex addiction or gambling addiction? What sensitivity should we show to those who came out of participation in the occult or to those who came out of religious backgrounds where there was a lot of control, a lot of guilt, a lot of fear, even abuse? You see, even though we might have a right to a gray area, love demands that we lay down that right, if necessary, for the sake of others. And Paul says, if love for others is not your guiding principle, then you really don't know Jesus like you think you do. Four principles for graying gracefully. The second is the principle of edification. The principle of edification. You know, the fact that the Corinthians even wrote to Paul and posed this question tells me something about their spiritual sensitivity. Tells me that they were eager to do what was right in God's eyes. They were eager to please the Lord. They were eager to avoid anything that would harm their progress in Christ. And they were eager to do whatever would promote their spiritual growth. And you know, that's the same kind of sensitivity that we need to have too. When you've had an encounter with God, Jesus said it creates within you a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. You want to do what's right. You want to do what pleases the Lord. You want to order your footsteps in the right path. I I've thrown out gray areas and some of you said, gosh, I never even thought. It never even occurred to me before. Our experience in Christ ought to leave us examining our lives. It ought to leave us thinking through the gray areas. Paul's answer to the problem of gray areas extends from chapter 8 all the way through the end of chapter 10. In chapter 10, Paul gives us another thing to consider when navigating the gray areas, and that's the impact on our own spiritual health. Indulging in some gray areas can put you at risk in crossing over the line 
and violating God's absolutes. One of the most important thing about navigating gray areas is to remember that there are some things that are not gray at all. God has given us absolutes in his word. We've already been talking about those as we've read through chapters 5 and 6 and 7 together. Sex outside of the beautiful covenant of marriage is not a gray area. It's an absolute. It's not acceptable to God if you've never been married. It's not acceptable to God if you were once married and are not married any longer. It's not acceptable to God if you're dating or engaged or living together. No matter how much you think you love one another, no, ma no matter how committed you think you are to one another, if you're that committed, go ahead and get married and get into God's order. It's not a gray area. It's an absolute. Homosexuality is not a gray area. It's an absolute. Pornography is not a gray area. It's an absolute according to Jesus, our Lord. Swearing and coarse joking, jokes that are full of innuendo, suggestive speech, they're not gray areas, they're absolutes. Drunkenness is not a gray area, it's an absolute. And you know, that immediately helps us to distinguish between illicit drugs and alcohol. The result of drugs is always intoxication, which makes it an absolute. Alcohol doesn't have to result in intoxication, which makes it a gray area, albeit one that requires extreme care. Any habit that has control over you, that has dominion over you, is not a gray area, it's an absolute. Paul said, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Greed is not a gray area, it's an absolute. Harboring hatred in your heart for someone is not a gray area, it's an absolute. Idolatry is not a gray area, it's an absolute. And it's important that we know the absolutes so that in navigating the gray areas, we don't set ourselves up to cross over that line. In chapter 10, Paul warns us not to be overconfident. Especially just because we have participated in religious services or religious rituals like water baptism or communion. We didn't take the time to read the verses, but in the early part of chapter 10, Paul talks about Israel's experiences in the wilderness. He says they were all baptized into the Red Sea. They all ate spiritual food and spiritual drink, the manna and the water that poured miraculously from the rock. And yet, he says, the corpses of all but two of them were scattered in the wilderness because they committed idolatry and the sexual immorality that comes with it. And Paul says that their stories were recorded for our example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things. Apparently, some of the Corinthians thought that religious experiences like water baptism or communion would safeguard them from the negative consequences of attending a dinner in, an, in a pagan temple. But Paul says it doesn't work that way. Religious rituals don't take the place of your obedience to Christ. He says if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And beloved, can I tell you that sometimes we fall prey to that same overconfidence. We think that because we've been to church, because we've served, because we've given, because we've received communion, that we're safe to venture out into the gray areas. And all of those things are real and they're powerful experiences, but none of those things can safeguard us if we cross the line. Instead, Paul says that we have to consider the principle of edification. Everything is permissible to me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is edifying. That word edify, it appears three times in these chapters, and it means to literally build a house. And it's one of the keys to navigating our gray areas. God has given me a set of absolutes. And as I consider a certain gray area, does it build me up? Does participating build me up and make me stronger to avoid God's absolutes? Or does it set me up to cross the line into sin? Drinking may be permissible for me, but does it set me up to cross the line into drunkenness? Going to a club may be permissible for me, but does it set me up to cross the line into sex outside of marriage? The lotto or bingo may be permissible for me, but does it set me up to cross the line into being mastered by something? By the way, 
I absolutely cannot advocate the lottery, but if you do play the lottery and you win, I would just want to remind you that the tithe belongs to the Lord, okay? <laughs> that movie, it may be permissible for me, but does it set me up to cross the line into lust or into anger? In his letter to the Philippians, Paul gives us a set of guidelines that can help us evaluate whether our gray areas are edifying. He says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are admirable, things that are virtuous, things that are praiseworthy, meditate on these things. By the way, in the book of Philippians, Paul says that that's the antidote to anxiety. If you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, the problem might just be your diet. What are you feeding your mind? What are you feeding your emotions? What are you feeding your will? What are you feeding your spirit? And listen, it's not just dark stuff or violent stuff that's problematic. It's the stuff that makes us discontent. It's the stuff that makes us feel sorry that we don't have what others have. Four principles for graying gracefully. The principle of love, the principle of edification. The third is the principle of spiritual engagement. The principle of spiritual engagement. In chapter 10, Paul explains that there is a material difference between eating a piece of meat that was sold in the marketplace and attending a sacrificial feast in an idol temple. Although idols are not gods at all, there are demonic spirits behind every idol. And when people worship those idols, they engage those demons. They come under the influence of those demons. Their behavior is influenced by those demons. They come under the, the oppression of those demons. And Paul says that that is an absolute no-no. Paul compares that with the Lord's Supper. In two weeks, Pastor Nick is going to bring you a great word about the Lord's Supper. Don't miss it. It's going to be one of the most powerful teachings you've had on the meaning of the Lord's Supper. But briefly, Paul says that when we gather at the Lord's table for communion, we engage the Lord. When we drink the cup, we engage the cleansing power of His blood. When we eat the bread, we engage the unifying power of His body. There is an aspect of communion that is certainly commemorative, but beloved, listen, communion is not merely symbolic. The Lord is present in the communion table, and there is an actual spiritual encounter that happens with those who come to the table in faith. When you come to worship at church, you engage the Lord. You engage his presence. You come under his influence. You receive blessings from him. You're engaging the Lord right now. You're under his influence right now. You're receiving blessings from him right now. You're going to have a better week this week because you were here in his presence right now. My mechanic has come to our services a few times. He has extended family members who come here and he's been here on a couple of special occasions and he said to me pastor he said every time I come to your church I feel happy all week he said I'm positive I'm in a good mood he said I don't know it's the singing the singing he said the singing it just stays with you all week and I just look at him and say Anthony if you feel that way why don't you come back <laughs> but the reason that he feels that way is because he engaged the Lord he came under the Lord's influence. He received blessings from the Lord. And listen, you don't have to wait for Sunday to engage the Lord. You can put on some worship anytime, anywhere that you are. You can open the Word. You can listen to the Word. You can pray and you can engage the presence of the Lord. But in the same way, there are other things that are doorways to engaging demons. For example, did you know that yoga mantras are the names of Hindu gods, which Paul says are actually demons. And when you chant those names, you are calling on that God. You are invoking that God. You are inviting that God to come and to empower you. Yoga is Hindu worship. Are you really sure that you can separate the physical exercise component of it with the spiritual roots of the practice? It's the same with martial arts. It's the same with Eastern meditation. 
Obviously, anything that has to do with astrology, with witchcraft, with paganism, is a doorway to engaging demons. Drugs are a doorway to engaging demons. The biblical word for witchcraft is pharmakeia, from which we get our English word pharmaceuticals. Just like worship music can cause us to engage God, there are certain kinds of music that can cause us to engage demons. New Age music, Eastern music, tribal music, certain kinds of rock music. Here's a question to ask you about your music. What kind of emotions does it stir up inside of you? Does it stir up feelings of happiness and well-being? Or does it make you moody? Does it make you feel hopeful or mournful? Does it make you feel sharp and alert and clear-headed? Or does it dull your senses? Does it make you peaceful or does it make you agitated? Does your music make you angry? The Bible says the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Listen, when you're partaking in someone else's rage, it stirs up rage. It agitates rage in you as well. So that's the third test for the gray areas. Is it a doorway to unwanted spiritual engagement that is absolutely forbidden? Four principles for graying gracefully. The principle of love, the principle of edification, the principle of spiritual engagement, and finally this, the principle of evangelism. The principle of evangelism. Worship team, come and help me if you would. At the very end of these chapters, Paul circles around to the point that he began with. When it comes to the gray areas in our lives, ultimately, our decisions need to be guided by what is most helpful for others rather than by our own interests and tastes. Paul says, for the sake of evangelism, go have dinner with your neighbor and don't make any issues out of the gray areas. If there's someone at the table that has a sensitivity to a particular issue, then for that person's sake, respond graciously. You know, I want to tell you that as a Jewish man and as a former Pharisee, Paul's words here were absolutely radical. A good Jewish boy would never ever consider going to eat at the home of a Gentile without questioning whether or not the menu was kosher. But Paul is saying to us, use your new freedom in Christ as an opportunity to form friendships with unbelievers and to influence them for Christ. And maybe we could finish up with an example that might just help us to apply some of these principles. One major gray area is alcohol. It is not a sin to drink, but it is absolutely a sin to get drunk. And I happen to be a believer who has a weak conscience when it comes to alcohol, a, a, an overactive conscience. I think part of it is because of my family situation as a kid. I have a sensitivity. I've seen the destruction that alcohol can bring to people's lives. I've seen the destruction it can bring to families. I experienced the destruction that it brought to my family. And my Pentecostal background lends itself towards legalism. And legalism can be very hard to shake. I don't drink. I don't care to drink. The Assemblies of God doesn't permit me to drink. Our pastors don't drink. We don't permit our deacons or our trustees to drink while they're serving on our board. So if you think you'd like to be a board member, you might want to think twice about that. And I have to tell you the truth, given my family history, the addictive nature of alcohol scares me and I would probably feel guilty if I took a drink. If it were up to me, I would just go ahead and I would make this gray area an absolute and be done with it. I wish none of you would drink. But you know what? It's not up to me. And making a gray area an absolute is never ever healthy for the body. It leads towards legalism and towards everything bad that comes with that. We've been there, we've done that, we're not going there again. As it turns out, Jesus drank wine and so did Paul. And the truth is the fact that Denise and I don't drink has proven to be a pretty big social barrier when we're gathered together with unbelievers through 
our kids' participation in school. We've been invited to different events, people's homes or different social events. And I don't know why it is, but if everybody's having cocktails and you order a club soda, it freaks people out. They just, they don't know what to do with that. They don't know why you're not drinking. It makes them feel so uncomfortable. And the fact that we don't drink has closed some social doors to us. Even though people understand, given our position, why we don't, you know, when they're having a cocktail party, they are not inclined to invite the couple that doesn't drink. But because some of you do drink in moderation, that social barrier is not there. And that gives you opportunities to befriend unbelievers and to influence them. But if a brother or a sister with a weak conscience is at the table, then you need to consider them in love before you imbibe. So what do we do with this gray area? Well, first of all, let gray be gray and refuse to make this gray area an absolute, no matter how hard you would like to. You know, when Denise and I talk to our kids about alcohol, we don't talk to them the same way that we were spoken to in the church as young kids. This is what we tell them. It is not, it is not a sin to drink, but it is absolutely a sin to get drunk. So mommy and daddy just avoid alcohol. And you will too, as long as you live in our house. By the way, dads and moms, you have every right to make absolute standards for your kids as long as they're living under your roof. When they grow up, when they're paying their own rent and their own insurance and buying their own groceries, they have to make their own decisions based on what we have given them and what we've deposited. But as long as they're under my roof, it's my rules. So your roof, your rules, moms and dads. Let gray be gray. And second, gray gracefully. Don't insist on your right to drink when it would offend the conscience of a weak brother or sister who might be there. And don't make a fuss about gray areas if it would alienate an unbeliever that you're eating with. You know, if someone offers us a drink, Denise and I just smile and say, we're teetotalers and we don't offer any more than that. If you offer us a drink, it will not offend us at all. We won't say yes, and I promise you, I will be counting how many you have. But if we can be gracious in this area where we are sensitive, then you can be gracious with others in the gray areas where you're sensitive. At the end of the day, Paul says it's all about loving the people that you're with, with the love of Christ, and being sensitive to their spiritual state so that you can win them to Christ and you can build them up in your faith in Christ. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether an unbelieving Jew or an unbelieving Greek or fellow believers, even as I try to accommodate everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many that they might be saved. Now follow my example as I follow Christ. And there's four principles for your gray areas. The principle of love, the principle of edification, the principle of spiritual engagement, and the principle of evangelism.